So it's been a little bit uh, since we've taken a look at r slash fat logic. Um, I am trying this out on a new recording and editing software. So we're going to see how this goes. Um, so, and since it's been a while since I covered fat logic, I figured I would take a look at five to six mo of the most recent posts. And we'll just kind of take a look at it and react kind of like old times back when I was very early in this channel. And to kind of give us a palate cleanser at the end, I've included a little bit of sanity this time. So, starting off with our first post. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the current state of fat phobia is equivalent to the state of sexism, homophobia, transphobia, etc. pre-1900s. That's how horrid and dire the situation is. Being gay was, and still is, illegal and punishable by death in many countries. Women were, and still are, forced into marriages, denied basic human rights, etc. Yes, beauty standards can be very harmful, and fat people do face aversion in society, but this comparison is just really fucking disrespectful. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Get the fuck away from me, you fat phobic asshole. <laughs> yeah, that's... And this is why fat acceptance loses support. This is why people don't want to support you. This is exactly why. Because you are comparing your idea of what fat phobia is and and you take it to the nth degree and compare it to actual serious oppression and major social issues in other parts of the world and say it's just as bad when it's very much not. Especially because the ability to even be obese to an extent is a privilege in and of itself. It means you have an abundance of food and the ability to not do hard labor all hours of the day. Because, I mean, that's that's kind of what it is. There are people that, let's say they eat 3,000 calories a day, but they have to do hard labor all day. So it doesn't show up like that. And, I mean, even with some obese people that eat and maybe work a little bit, it's still not the same as someone who's doing hard, hard labor. So you guys have, there is a level of privilege here that is never acknowledged because you guys are so fixated on saying that it's your body's genetics when everyone fucking knows it's not. It's not. I hate the people that try to, to push the social determinants of health and the and genetics and food deserts and fucking everything on why someone is obese. And don't get me wrong. Those are, there are issues of food deserts. There are issues of, I, I don't know about genetics, but there's an issue with, like, unsafe neighborhoods to walk in. And, like, there there are some, like, social uh, determinants that will make it much harder. But the thing is, is that obesity stems from the overconsumption of calories with, without burning anything to balance it out. That is what causes obesity. There may be things around it that make things harder. I'm not going to deny that. I'm very fortunate to have a very active job right now. And that has made it easier to maintain my weight. But I still fucking eat too much. I know I eat too much. I kind of fell off the wagon. And pretty much my goal right now until New Year is just to maintain. That's just my goal right now because... I'm a little overwhelmed with everything going on, both stuff that I've mentioned in previous videos and all that other stuff that I don't have the capacity to really focus on weight loss right now, but that doesn't mean that I am going to just throw up my hands and gorge myself as a way to comfort myself for the stress that I'm feeling. I'm going to lower the priority of weight loss down to just maintenance for now to make it easier for me. And I am still focusing though on physical activity because the physical activity helps with the stress. Lowering my calories right now is not helping with my stress, but the exercise is. So my goal is simply to maintain my weight, but maintain, but also maintain my current activity level because it's helping me. There are going to be times when 
even if you do need to prioritize weight loss, maybe you can't because you're working three jobs and you have kids and you have all these other pressures. I'm not going to deny that. But ultimately, the, at the end of the day, it still does come down to you eating too much, going into denial, saying that, no, it's just, I, it's impossible for me to lose weight, is not the answer. Sometimes you will have to dial it way back and take tiny ass baby steps. That doesn't really, even really feel like you're doing anything at all. But if that's what you have to do to at least mi- move, even if it's at a snail's pace, you are moving in the right direction. That's what matters. The games on the Wii Fit Plus are incredibly fun, but I really hate the anti-fat, BMI-obsessed aspects of it. It classified me as on the high end of at risk of becoming overweight. So I set my fitness goal to gaining exactly enough weight to put me in the overweight category. Now it'll have to encourage me to do what it's designed to prevent. Fuck you, Wii Fit. What in the fuck? What? I will never understand. Here's the thing. So I've been really on a Pokemon kick, right? I've been on a huge Pokemon kick, even probably by the time this comes out, because this won't be coming out until December. I'm recording this in early November. And I don't expect to suddenly lose interest in that span of time. I'm on a big Pokemon kick, and I'm like, you know what I would really like? I would love a Pokemon fitness app where it takes, like, your buddy from Pokemon Go and... Like, you have to walk your buddy or or whatever, and it can it can work, in, like, in tandem with Pokemon Go. And, like, I don't know, maybe you can take some of the, the physical strength, like um, Machamp, and you can have, like, a workout routine with Machamp. Like, that sounds really fun to me, but then I know that there's going to be assholes like this that ruin a perfectly good app, that ruin a perfectly good idea because it makes them feel bad. Like... Honestly, why are you doing We Fit Plus if this is going to be your fucking attitude? Whether you like it or not, weight is connected to health. So, and and you putting your goal at gaining weight, the game doesn't, the game is just a series, like a series of code. Like, it's not, you're not showing the game anything. You're not showing the creators anything. We Fit Plus is fucking how old now? I, I don't know how recent this post is. It's new on Fat Logic. It re- was recently posted on Fat Logic, but I don't know how new the post is from the social media site that it's from. But regardless, We Fit Plus is very old at this point. If you kept your Wii around or your Wii U around and you still enjoy it, that's perfectly fine. I'm all for enjoying those old games and still finding value in them. But people have long moved past this. You aren't showing anybody. You're just hurting yourself. I just, I don't understand. I don't understand why they think that they, like, showing the game does anything. Fuck you, We Fit. We Fit doesn't care. All right? We Fit. We Fit is just a game. It doesn't care. Why did you buy it? It's pretty... Like, I remember, I remember on the E3 conference when they showed Wii Fit and everything that it did. It was pretty obvious that it was going to weigh you first thing. I don't understand why this is, like, news to you or why it's such an issue for you. Your weight is not to blame for your health problems. You are not to blame for your health problems. So here's the thing. To a degree, if you get, like, cancer or some genetic, like truly genetic, truly genetic condition. We're talking rheumatoid arthritis. We're talking um, type 1 diabetes. We're talking like a truly genetic condition. No, you're not to blame. If your health problems include high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, you have a role to play in that. High cholesterol, you have a role to play in that because behaviors can rectify those issues to at the very least an extent. Even if it doesn't completely wipe it out, let's say there is a genetic predisposition to any of those things. That doesn't mean that you have no contribution to those issues. 
And this type of this type of thinking, I this is part of the reason another reason why I fucking hate that acceptance. Because it encourages people to be like, I have zero fucking control over my health and my life. I miss when like okay, I I miss and I don't miss. There is an issue with it entirely blaming the individual for everything. Like I I see that. But making it a complete like issue that no one has control over or it's someone else's fault isn't right either. I just, I wish people saw that they had more control than they, of their lives than they think they do. Is that a hundred percent? Fuck no. I can't get a job that I want. I can't get a teaching job to save my fucking life. I'm doing my best. I have done everything that I consider to be right? Are there things that I'm missing? Possibly. Probably. I'm definitely missing experience, but it's kind of hard to get that when you can't get a position to get the experience. And there's just some things that I probably didn't consider or didn't think about. But that doesn't mean that I have zero control. That doesn't mean that I just stop applying to jobs and throw up my hands and say it's impossible. You just keep trying. You know? You just do what you can and you try your best. Throwing up your hands and being in denial and that nothing can solve it, you have no input in ha- anything that's happened to you is such a victim mentality and such a really sad way to live. As a fat person, choosing not to pursue weight loss is an act of self-care. Again, this fucking giving up, no, it's not an act of self-care. It is an act of just giving up on yourself. As a fat person, and, and like even as an overweight person, choosing not to pursue weight loss in any capacity. And here's the thing. I feel like there's this overcomplation that weight loss has to be some sort of biggest loser, major diet, regimented diet plan. I mean, if you are over 300 pounds, you probably do need that sort of plan. But if you are like the average overweight or average obese person being 250 or between like 200, 250 in, in that range even a little above or a little below if you're in the obese category but you're in a in a way to get it down I think weight loss can look a lot more like I start walking twice a week even once a week start with once a week for 10 minutes and then you slowly build on that over time that's a total legitimate pursuing of weight loss Cutting out soda is a legitimate form of pursuing weight loss. Cutting out sugar, processed sugar, one day a week is a legitimate form of pursuing weight loss. There are ways to pursue weight loss and ways to pursue healthier habits that don't have to be this all or nothing fad diet. And I feel like that's what fad acceptance really pushes is if you're dieting, then you are doing this huge unhealthy thing that is perpetuating diet culture and unhealthy beauty ideals. And that's not necessarily what it is. Stop. I mean, I, I feel like, I feel like one of the biggest issues with the fat acceptance people is that they are unable to see the value of losing weight purely for themselves, not for aesthetics, Not to please someone else, not to fit into some sort of societal norm that they always talk about. None of that. Lose weight simply because you want to. Just simply because you want to. A, I think that's a a completely foreign concept to them and I don't think that they understand it. And rather than seeing how some people can want to lose weight purely for themselves. Purely for themselves, be it to aid health or I don't know simply simply to get that like there there are sometimes when you just do something just to do it it's like that's a, that's a thought that doesn't compute to them at all it's like why do you color 
because you want to. Same reason why I pursue weight loss. Because I want to. I don't I don't need more of a reason than that. It can get dangerous if you get to like severely underweight or something, but it doesn't have to be this big insidious thing. My almost four year old just said, My body is asking for a drink and my heart says it wants milk. And this is what we mean when we say kids are natural, intuitive eaters. Now, there's some responses to this that I'll cover in a second, but I want to cover this thing real first, real quick first. I don't want. I already don't like the fact that they are teaching their child separate that their body is like separate from themselves. I really, really hate this line. It's this philosophy that they don't, it's almost like sometimes they don't even realize they have in fat acceptance where you treat your body and mind as two separate things. It fucking, it drives me up the fucking wall. I remember as a kid, the whole thing was body, mind, spirit, connection. That's fucking gone. Fuck that. No way. Everything should be separated. Everything in its own fucking corner. And it's like, but everything literally is connected. How your body reacts to things and how you feel are connected. Your mind is not this separate functioning thing from your body. You're, I, I, this is not to harp on the kid. I want to be clear. This is not to harp on the kid. This is to harp on the adult that is teaching the kid to, to talk like this. My body is asking for a drink. You are thirsty. The, you say, I'm thirsty. Because you are a person not just a fucking body. I just, mm. And my heart says it wants milk. No, you just, you kind of feel like milk. And maybe the kid does feel like milk. I'm not against giving kids milk. I want to be clear about that. But saying my heart wants milk, it just feels like such a justification for making a poor choice. Not, and again, this is not about the kid. This is about clearly the way the adult has taught them to talk. You talk about what your body is asking for and then what your heart wants. Well, my heart wants chocolate, so I should eat all the fucking chocolate I want until I throw up. No. I realize I'm taking it to a bit of an extreme there. But I hate it. I hate it. Sometimes we want things that aren't good for us. Sometimes it's okay to indulge in those things. And sometimes we should exercise a bit of self-restraint and not eat the things simply because we want them. Again... Sometimes it's better to restrain yourself and not do the thing you want. And if you want to tie this back to me saying that... Actually, this can even go into the weight loss. I lose weight because I want to. Sometimes you should restrain yourself and not lose weight if you are already underweight. That applies too. But the comments for this one say... Uh, can you please recommend books to teach kids intuitive eating and haze as... For as young as age one, before they can talk. That, for some reason, that really seems culty to me, and I don't like it. But Blue... So that was um, someone whose name has been marked out in black, and then this blue person says, Kids are naturally intuitive eaters. You don't need to teach them. Just trust them. Red chimes in. Yes, Blue is correct. Kids are naturally intuitive eaters. You don't need to teach them, and certainly not a one-year-old. The ch that child only knows to react, maybe crying, maybe some other sign, when hungry, but can't feed themselves. Counting on you to get them food. We need to take our examples from a one-year-old. And then the original question, like, person asking the question seems to be, get, like, kind of, flippant about it says I'm not I am not talking about teaching them I'm talking about fostering it so they can keep being intuitive eaters into later childhood and adulthood I guess I'm asking the wrong group because I have seen other groups that talk about ways to help your child to foster intuitive eating seeing all foods as equal and body positivity I I really hope that there becomes so much infighting that their whole way of thinking falls apart. I really do. This, this is just so... Here's the thing. One-year-olds, yes, 100% intuitive eaters. You should just, if a one-year-old is um, saying that they're hungry, chances are they're hungry. Like, you should just don't, I would not, 
I don't think it's even recommended that you, like, moderate a child's food intake until, like, age four, if they, and only then if they're, like, really over-consuming. And it's even less about, like, monitoring, m- moderating their food intake, but more the types of foods that they eat, because they'll start to gravitate towards candy and shit food because it's hyper-palatable. It's just, this whole thing is weird. And our final one today, before our bit of sanity as a palate cleanser is for our younger guests and it's a picture of what looks to be apples oranges and raisins it says just like stella did we love our littlest guests we also know sometimes it's hard to sit stillish and wait for their meals so we're introducing stella's snack bowl we hope our younger guests will enjoy a healthy snack to take the edge off while waiting for their meals one snack per child, please, ages six and under. So this is kind of understandable because kids, especially six and under, I think that's not a bad age range, um, don't have the ability to, like, their concept of time is so off. One minute is an hour to them. And when they're hungry, it's, it just, they, it, it's already an uncomfortable feeling being hungry. As adults, we can handle it just fine. But as a young child, it's a, this weird, strange form of discomfort that is just unbearable. So I think that this is a fine idea. A few raisins, something small. I don't, although for six and under, I wouldn't even recommend giving them like a full orange or anything because they're gonna, their stomachs are small. They're gonna fill up pretty quickly. But I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, Philip says, I think this is a great idea to give something for the littlest kids while they wait. Only problem is, I don't see any snacks for them, just a random bowl of fruit. Where are the snacks? I don't even know how to respond. (laughs) I don't even know how to respond to that. Uh, Alyssa says, kids don't stop being kids at six. If it's for kids, it should go to 18, the age they stop being kids. The thing is, though, is that a 17-year-old is perfectly capable of understanding that food is coming, and they have a better sense of time, and they can, like, tolerate their sense of hunger until the food comes. This isn't a 3-year-old that doesn't understand anything. Destiny says, 6 and under, once you're 7, you can wait. Should it be 10 at least, these are little humans. So I think the reason for the six and under is because once the kids get to about second grade, there's, there's a pretty hum like it's pretty huge. And I mostly notice it because I work in an elementary school where I get to see five, six and seven year olds. The distance of maturity and development between ages five and seven is huge. A five year old, a little kindergartner, I think would barely be able to stand waiting for the meal if they're really hungry because it's like when is it coming this is taking forever like they're they're easily distracted time is just not there seven still can struggle a little bit but they would know that food is coming and that mom doesn't necessarily want them to eat anything because then they won't be hungry for their food there there's a pretty big gap in understanding between the two I would say that as a parent, though, if I went to sit down at that restaurant and there was a bowl of fruit and snacks with that sign on it, I would take it off the table for my seven-year-old so they wouldn't be tempted. I think that's the only thing. I'm like, I better be able to move that bowl because I think that's me to put it in front of the kid and say, you can't have any. Uh, Daniel says, this is great, but also consider getting some bananas, especially with smaller children. They are much cleaner and easier to eat than apples or tangerines and don't feel the little stomach as much as raisins do before actual food. I don't know what you're thinking, but I would think raisins fill the stomach far less than a banana does. Like a, like a full banana is a lot, especially for a small stomach. Raisins don't really have any fiber to them they're all sugar and so i mean it's not great maybe a half a pack of raisin just a little something to hold them over 
I'm not sure that they need it anyway, but it's, it's, I've never worked with, like, a three-year-old, really, so I'm not sure what they can stand, and I could see how a ravenous five-year-old might need a few raisins before their food comes, depending on how long mom and dad waited before they actually chose the restaurant. So, those are my thoughts on that. Let's get to the sanity. Can exercise really beat the blues? Growing body of evidence says it does. It's been widely reported that exercise might be a more effective treatment for reducing symptoms of depression. On average, according to a high-quality study from the University of South Australia, physical activity appears to be 1.5 times more effective than standard treatments. That is, better than medication or psychotherapy. Could it be true? The researchers analyzed 97 meta-reviews of more than a thousand randomized controlled trials, and exercise was consistently more beneficial in treating mild to moderate symptoms of depression, psychological stress, and anxiety. Perhaps the most important conclusion of the study is that physical activity should be designated as a first-line mental health treatment rather than an add-on. This means a prescribed exercise program would have equal standing with medication and psychotherapy. I'm all for that. I won't say depression. I've never been diagnosed with depression. Um, and the times when I think I had it, I didn't exercise well. But I will say as someone who... I've also not been diagnosed with anxiety. But I know I've experienced times of high anxiety. And I think I do struggle with some anxiety personally. Um, but since I've been on like a regular exercise routine, I do much better. And on weeks when either I've been sick or I've been like on my period where it's been a lot harder for me to exercise, um, I feel the anxiety more after a week of not exercising. So I, I think that this definitely has some merit. I'd be curious to know what the fat acceptance people think of it. But I think it's... I, I like that it's put on par with medication and psychotherapy. This does not mean that exercise will cure everyone of depression. But I think that it's worth exploring as a first line before medication... I think maybe trying it in tandem with psychotherapy. Some people do just need the medication, so I don't, I'm glad that they're not like ruling it out and treating it like a cure all or anything. But I think it's something that would definitely be worth exploring for a lot of people, especially for those um, experiencing more mild symptoms. But let me know what you think about that. Okay, so that is our video for today. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.